Today I'm going to be teaching Dark Souls the card game, a 1-4 to four player game from Steamforge Games. To start with setup, we're going to start with these two boards. One of these will be a player board and the other will be an enemy board. Of course, you can choose which one you want to be the player or enemy board. It really doesn't matter. And you can also orient them in any direction you wish. For the purpose of this demonstration, I will orient them like this so it's just easier to see. Next up is this double-sided board. There are two bosses pictured on each side of the board and you get to choose which two bosses you want to face. For the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to be using this side, but of course you could also choose two different bosses. Next, somewhere near the board, you're going to want to get all the stamina cards. You're going to have four two soul cost cards and four five soul cost cards. You can place these anywhere you wish that players can reach. For the sake of this demonstration, they are going to be off camera. Next, you'll want to set an encounter in enemy area. You're going to have your encounter decks, one, two, and three. Your enemy decks, skull, helmet, helmet, and sword. And then you'll have two loot decks. The only reason I have them face up here is because they're impossible to differentiate when you flip them over. The only way to tell the difference between normal loot here is that there is no blue gem for the transposed loot down here. But both of these will be shuffled and flipped into their own pile. And lastly, player setup. The base game comes with four classes to choose from. For this game, I'm just going to do a two player game. So I will just choose the knight and the sorcerer for the sake of this example. The assassin and the herald are two other classes that you can choose from. Each class has their own class deck to start with. And you can find which cards belong to which class by the symbol in the top right hand corner. So you can see this matches the knight symbol. So all the cards in this deck go to the knight. Players will also take the bonfire deck which will have five cards in it and will have the blazing bonfire on top. Lastly, players will take the Remnant of Humanity deck. This deck will be placed into the player inventory and players can access this deck at any time that they wish so. The inventory is essentially basically where bought cards are put. All players share the same inventory and can take and put cards into the inventory as much as they wish. You should also have a place for all your tokens. There's hit tokens, status effect tokens, souls, of the small and big variety and encounter complete tokens. All of these will be off screen for this demonstration. All right, now how to play. To start playing the game, players must choose an encounter. They start here at the bonfire and must choose one of the connecting encounter spaces. For this demonstration, I will show this, but you could always choose here, you can choose here or here. So if my party chooses to go here, I will draw and reveal one encounter card. Since we're playing a two player game, we're gonna follow this row but just to go over what each, in the column here, this is how much loot the encounter will give you if you defeat it. This is the amount of skull enemies, the amount of helmet enemies, and the amount of helmet and sword enemies. For the two player game, we will just be showing off two skull enemies. Before moving into how encounters actually work, let's talk about movement on the board. So let's just say that this encounter has already been completed. We just completed it and now we can choose. So once again, you can start from the starting location and go to one of these other encounters, or you can go to one that's connected to that encounter, AKA this one. Before the encounter begins, players will draw six cards into their hand. Then, as you can see here, I drew just stamina cards and one shield, but no weapon. So I have a choice here. I can either keep this deck or I can do a mulligan. I will draw this back into my deck and then draw six new cards, but I must take those new six cards. If instead my hand had a weapon, like this hand does, for my first draw, then I would not be able to do a mulligan. I would just have to keep this hand and hope for the best. First off, on whichever board players have decided as a player board, players will take their character cards and place them into spaces. I'm gonna place the knight here, and the sorcerer I'm gonna place next to him, just for the sake of example, and just so that we can still see him. But you could also put him in the back row here, or over here, or basically anywhere you wish but for this example, he's gonna go there. Then we will draw and reveal our two enemy cards. One is going to go here and one will go here. Just to give you a quick overview of how the enemy cards work and why I place this skeleton in the upper left-hand corner. First off, we have the enemy type here. The soul reward is over here. This is from what set it's from. That's how much armor, how much health, how much damage it does. Right here, this bottom part is the position the enemy will be in. And then this is where that enemy will attack. And then any special abilities is going to be listed down here. Now the encounter begins. Enemies will attack first. 
Now this one will attack straight into this zone, hitting the sorcerer. The sorcerer will take 3 damage, means they either discard 3 cards, or they block it. Now when you are attacked, you typically have 2 options depending on what's in your hand. You can defend using armor or some sort of shield, or you can just discard the amount of cards of damage. So if we do 3 cards of damage, we could just choose to discard 3 cards. Now the other option would be to actually defend. And in that case, we would only discard one card, perhaps. Because in this case, we could discard one stamina in order to keep the armor in hand, but to block three damage. Otherwise, we could spend one stamina to block four damage, but we would discard the card in the process. Now this enemy is attacking the space up here that's just off camera, and there's nobody in that space. This means that this enemy would attack the character with the highest taunt value in the same row. But of course, again, there's nobody in that row. That means it moves to the next row and attacks yet again the character with the highest taunt value. In this case, is the knight with 10 taunt. The one exception to enemy attacks actually hitting is area attacks. An area attack symbol will look like this. In our example, our characters were in the front left here and the front middle. Thus, this area attack would actually miss. They would not be hit by this particular demon. Then it becomes the character's turn. You have several actions that you can perform, but you can only do one of each per turn. First of all, you can discard one or more cards to draw an equal number of cards from your deck. You can also move your character one space in to the left, to the right, down, or up, depending on where they are. You can also swap positions between two characters, but in doing so, you'll end the movement for each character. Each character can only move one space per activation. You can make an attack action, which we will go over. First of all, in order to perform an attack action, your character must be in the same column as the enemy you're attacking. So in this case, the knight can attack the skeleton, and the sorcerer, because he's right here, can't actually attack anybody because there's nobody in this column. For our attack action against the skeleton, this is our knight's hand. He has one long sword and several stamina cards. Now the skeleton has no armor and only one health point. So the knight has several options. The knight could spend one yellow, one red, and one stamina of any color in order to do two damage and also keep this card in their hand. This symbol here means that you get to keep the card if you perform the action. Also, the knight could choose to spend one yellow, but also discard the longsword in order to do two damage. Lastly, the knight could spend two yellow and two stamina of any color in order to do three damage and discard the card. Since the last two are pretty much overkill considering this is a weak enemy, the best option in this case would probably be to keep the longsword in hand. The symbol in the upper left hand corner refers to the damage type associated with the weapon. This is important for certain enemies that have a listed weakness. In the case of the skeleton here, there is no weakness, but this enemy over here does have, and it's magic. What this means that if you attack this enemy with the same magic type, you can ignore their defense. Now in this case, you wouldn't really have to worry about ignoring defense because either way, this enemy would be dead. But if this enemy had much higher defense, you might have to worry about that. There are of course some monsters that have way more health than you can defeat in a single action. So you will have to track their health using tokens. If the number of tokens on their card matches the total number of their health, then that monster is defeated. You can use one non-attack action on an equipment card. If you choose to use an item from your hand, it could be items like this. This item will allow you to take two items from your discard pile and place them on top of your deck. This item here, you can be used for dodging attacks or you can use it to heal. This will allow you to take five cards from the bottom of your discard and put it at the bottom of your draw pile. Now there are some key things I didn't go over, but you will see more of these if you just look at the reference card that comes with the game. Or use your heroic ability. The heroic ability for each character is listed down below, and basically will require you to flip the card. So if I use the sorcerer's ability here, then I wouldn't be able to do it again until we visit the bonfire. Once all enemies have been defeated and the encounter is complete, you will gain the soul reward, let's just say six for this example, and any standard loot cards that the encounter would give you. Now these rewards do not go into the inventory. Instead, they go into what is called the loot pile. And your group has a choice at this point. You can either tackle the next encounter 
and potentially lose this, or you can go rest at the bonfire. If you rest at the bonfire, you get to keep your reward. If you go on to another encounter, the new rewards that you gain from your next encounter is gonna what's be in the loot pile, and these rewards will move into the inventory. You will continually do encounters until you defeat both bosses. Boss encounters work pretty much the same, but they are slightly different. In this case, this group moved from this encounter, defeated it, and now is going to attempt the boss. Now each boss in this game is special, so they have different setup rules, and they also work slightly different. For this example, I'm just going to kind of show how one boss works, but any of the rest can be looked up in the rulebook. Now Woolner here starts with his left hand and his right hand and a body. You cannot though attack the body, you have to attack the hands, and the only way to attack the hands is if they are in the front row, unless you have a ranged attack. The way bosses work is you'll have a deck with the symbol of the boss on it, and then when they move to attack, you will draw their card and then resolve its effects. In this case, we can see that Wolner's left hand will move up, do an area attack, attacking the front row here, the back row, and also the middle, but then shift any character attacked one space over. It also do four damage, and it has magical weakness. When choosing to rest at a bonfire, the bonfire deck comes into play. In this case, you will just lose the top card, and you'll see what bonfire level you're at. Two here, and then when revealed, gain one common treasure. That happens immediately, and also your deck size will increase. This will continue. You will get another effect. Your deck size will increase again. One more time, and then finally, your deck will be as high as it can be, but you no longer gain rewards, and this is your final chance. If you do not win the game and have to rest at a bonfire, you lose the game. That does it for this walkthrough. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this tutorial and you would like to see more or any of my other content, please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. If for whatever reason this walkthrough just didn't do it for you and you want to leave some feedback, please feel free to do that as well. Till next time, I'll catch you next game night. Bye.